thank you for inviting me, preacher. And uh, uh, let's, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Job. The book of Job. Uh, some say that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And uh, that may very well be so. Uh, Job goes back a long ways. And um, I want you to look with me in chapter 1. Chapter 1 of the book of Job. Hope you all don't mind me drinking a little water this morning. One church I preached in, I just drank water and drank water and drank water. And I, somebody shook my hand at the back door when it was over and they said, man, that, that sure was a shame. You drunk all that water and it still turned out dry. They said so. <laughs> so I hope it's not too dry. Job chapter 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. And his substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses and a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and the substance, his substance is increased in the land. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee uh, to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father, we are grateful again to be in the house of the Lord. We ask you, God, that you would uh, bless your word this morning. Bless it to each one of our hearts. And I pray you'll speak to our hearts, Lord, and touch us and help us. Uh, God, give us a greater desire to love you and serve you because of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to call your attention especially to verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Uh, for a few minutes this morning, I want to just uh, try to uh, uh, teach a little bit on uh, what uh, Satan asked the Lord here. Uh, Doth Job fear God for naught? Uh, will, will a person serve God for nothing? Will a person serve God for nothing? In other words, Satan was asking the Lord, do you think for one minute uh, that Job is serving you just because you're God? In other words, he accuses Job of serving the Lord because of what he gets out of him. 
He said, now, you know, you've been real good to Job. You have really blessed this man. You've put a hedge about everything he's got. Well, the devil knew there was a hedge there because he couldn't get to Job. Apparently, he had tried, but he couldn't get to him. He said, you've put a hedge about it. You've blessed him. You've given him anything any man could possibly want. Sure, he's serving you. What do you think? Do you think a man will serve God for nothing? I think that's a good question. Does anybody serve God just because of who God is? Does anyone serve the Lord just because they love God? Would we still serve God if he did nothing for us? That's a good question. Somehow the devil apparently thinks that the most foolish thing anybody can do is to love the Lord, worship the Lord, serve the Lord, and uh, live their whole life for God. Because if somebody does that, if somebody really loves God and they're really serving God and they're really living for God, it's like the devil is always suspicious of your motive. In other words, now, he's got to be having some reason for doing that. I mean, you know, show me this guy that goes to church and lives for God, serves the Lord, honors God, praises God, worships the Lord. And the devil's thinking, scratching his head, he's saying, now, I've got to figure this out. That he, there's something going on here that doesn't appear on the surface. He's got some motive that we don't know anything about right now. Because you see, uh, the devil uh, originally was the one who uh, rebelled against God in his heart and uh, who wanted to be like God, who wanted God's place, he wanted God's position, he wanted God's throne. Uh, he really wasn't interested in serving God because of who God is. Um, uh, he was wanting something out of it. Um, somebody asked me a question once about the devil. They said, well, preacher, if, if God is such a good God, why in the world did he ever make a devil? I said, well, you got to understand when the Lord made him, he didn't make him a devil. He made him a beautiful angel. And it was only because of Satan's pride and rebellion that he became the devil. And God had to cast him out of heaven. But when God made him, he made him an angel. He was an archangel. And uh, so it was the devil's pride and rebellion. Uh, that also goes back to another question I was asked about the Lord and his character. Uh, someone said, if God loves everybody and God loves us and he's a compassionate God like you say, then why do terrible things happen? Why are there so many tragedies? Uh, why are there hurricanes and tornadoes? And why are there heart attacks? And why is there cancer? And, and they just named off all the all long list of terrible things that happen. And they do happen. And we live in that kind of world where they happen quite often. And uh, it was like, uh, why did God make a world with all this kind of evil in it? I said, well, you know, you have to understand that when the Lord made this world, when he created this world, uh, that uh, everything was good. Everything God made in six days, he saw it and it was good. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, there were no tornadoes. There were no hurricanes. There was no such thing as death. Uh, there were no heart attacks. There was no cancer. But it was only after man disobeyed, sinned against God, and rejected God's plan that the curse came upon this earth as a result of man's sin. 
But that's another thought. But sometimes, you know, if we're not careful, we have a tendency to misjudge the Lord. But the devil, he don't understand why anybody would serve the Lord for no reason at all. There's got to be something behind it. And understand it was the it was the Lord that initiated this conversation. Uh, when Satan approached God's throne, he said, have you considered my servant Job? A preacher friend of mine made this comment on that. He said, you know, I would just assume the Lord didn't mention me to the devil. <laughs> and, uh, but the, Lord, the Lord's bragging on Job. He said, what about my servant Job? You thought about him lately? What a man he is. Um, he said, well, I tell you, I have considered Job, but you're wrong about him. Uh, you think he's serving you because he loves you, but he's pulled the wool over your eyes. You've blessed him. You've been good to him. Uh, he'd be a fool not to serve you. Look what he's getting out of you. He said, but if you let me take away what Job has got, I'll guarantee you Job will curse you to your face. Now, thank God that's not true of everyone, and it wasn't true of Job. Uh, we do live in a world today where a lot of people have the idea that God is just some kind of big Santa Claus and that all he's around for is just to dump a bag of goodies on everybody. But that's the wrong concept of the Lord altogether. And uh, sometimes people are deceived by that idea. He said, but now if you let me take what he's got, uh, Job will curse you. Somebody said one time that they believe the theme of the book of Job is why do Christians suffer? But someone else suggested that the theme of the book of Job might be, why do we serve God? Why do we serve God? Um, why Christians suffer? That's, that's quite the question. Um, Christians do suffer. You know, Jesus said, the wise man built his house on the rock. And he said the rains came, the floods came, and beat on the house. But the house stood because it's founded on a rock. But the foolish man builds his house on the sand. And he said the rains came, the winds blow, and the floods came, and beat on the house, and the house fell because it was on the sand. In reality, the same thing happens to both houses. The house on the rock and the house on the sand will face the same adversity in this life. Christians are not exempt from winds, floods, rains, and whatnot that comes against it. Christians get cancer just like unsaved people do. Christians have heart attacks just like unsaved people do. Uh, Christians face tragedies. As God's children, we go down to the same uh, funeral homes and visit the same cemeteries that the unsaved world visits. We're not exempt from this. The difference is the unsaved person whose house is on the sand has nothing to hold them up. They have no firm foundation to stand on when these tragedies come. But the child of God has a rock to stand on. The child of God has someone to support them. The Christian has a friend that sticks closer than a brother that will go with you to the hospital and he will go with you to the cemetery 
And he will never leave you and never forsake you. So we face the same kind of problems. Don't listen to these so-called health and wealth preachers that try to tell you that if you're right with God, you're not going to face any of these problems. <laughs> That's not found in the Bible. It's not found in the Bible. We will have these difficulties. But as a child of God, you will have a friend to walk with you during those times. And he'll hold your hand. And he'll watch over you. And he'll love you. And he'll care for you. And he'll be there to pick you up when you fall. Well, so Job, are you serving God, Job, because you know you've been blessed? I think this whole idea presents us about three questions. Will an individual serve God when they are suffering? Now, we're not going to take time to read the whole story of Job, but most of you understand that Job, Job very soon lost everything he had. When he woke up, when he woke up in the morning, he was the wealthiest man in that part of the world at that time. He had more possessions, more flocks, more herds, camels, sheep, everything you could imagine. The man was just, as they would say today, he was filthy rich. He had everything that morning. He had 10 children. But when the sun set that day, I'm not talking about over a process of a few years. I'm talking about when the sun set that day, Job had nothing. He was sitting in an ash heap. All of his possessions were gone. All 10 of his children were taken in one day. One day. He had to bury 10 kids in one day. Everything, everything was gone. Can a man serve God in that kind of suffering? What a question. What a question. Well, the answer is given in the last part of chapter 1 of Job. The Bible says in verse number 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped and worshiped and he said naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away blessed be the name of the Lord in all this Job sinned not nor charged God foolishly Now, I'm going to tell you something. What I just read to you is easy to read and it's easy to preach, but it's awful hard to practice. When awful things happen in your life and you know you've tried your best to serve the Lord, it's not easy to do what Job did. He fell down. The first thing he did, he worshiped God. You know, you observe a lot of things through years of ministry. And uh, I guess you can gather by what Pastor Spears said that I've been in the ministry quite a while. Um, the Lord called me to preach when I was 16 years old. And... Uh, one of the first things I did, I went down to a radio station in the area and asked the man to sell me some time on the radio. 
he first looked at me like I was crazy because he couldn't understand what a 16-year-old kid was doing down there wanting to buy time on the radio. I said, I want to preach. He said, you want to do what? I said, I want to preach. And looking back on it, I, I, I still can't believe he actually did sell me some time, but he did. And that's where I got started, preaching on radio, and then later began to pastor. But I've, I, you, you watch a lot of things through the years. And I've seen tragedy uh, and suffering sometimes um, uh, cause a lot of people uh, to not worship the Lord. I've visited people a lot of times. I say, uh, do you go to church? Well, I used to go to church. Well, uh, what happened? And then they tell me about some tragedy or something that happened in their life. And uh, I talked to a man a while back, not long ago. And I said, you, you know, I was just trying to get a conversation, talk to him about the Lord. And he just come out and told me, he said, well, look, I'm going to tell you how it is. He said, I'm, I'm mad with God. I said, you're mad with God? He said, yeah, I'm mad with God. I said, well, what's going on? Well, he told me a story. He had a daughter that uh, had a tragedy. She uh, got involved in taking drugs, and she OD'd, and his daughter died. But he told me, he said, I'm mad because God let that happen. But you have to understand that you know, God also allows us to make choices. He allows us to make decisions. And we have to live with the consequences of the choices we make in life. And I don't think it's, you know, it's not fair to blame God for things we do. But he told me, he said, I, I used to go to church. I used to do this. I mean, he was very active. He said, forget it, I'm done with it. He said, I'm mad with God. So sometimes this awful thing of suffering and tragedy in people's life, uh, they let it defeat them, they let it destroy them. Um, over in Hebrews chapter 11, you know, you read a long list of people that had great faith and God used them in wonderful ways. And... Uh, and in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, you know, there's just uh, hero after hero of the faith. Uh, there's, uh, of course, he mentions Abel and Enoch and Noah, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua. And it goes on and on and on. And you get down to Hebrews 11 and verse 32 and he said, what more, and what shall I more say for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel. And uh, he said, these were those who had, uh, verse 34, he said, they quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. They waxed valiant in fight. They turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. So in some times, God does work great miracles in the lives of his people. Sometimes God chooses to heal cancer. Sometimes God chooses to heal disease. Sometimes God chooses to intervene in miraculous ways in the life of his people. Sometimes he does. And that's evident here. But look how he worded it in verse 36. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, bonds, imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. You see, there's a lot of things we don't understand. I mean, sometimes God intervenes in the life of his people. Sometimes he literally works miracles. But then in others' lives, sometimes he chooses that they go through persecution. Some were stoned. Stephen was stoned to death. 
for preaching. <laughs> Paul and Silas were beaten and put in jail at Philipp Philippi for preaching. We don't understand these things. We may not comprehend it. But the question is that when we're called upon to suffer, are we going to still serve God? Will we still worship God? Now that's easy to say. It's easy for me to stand here and say that I believe I would, but hey, you know, that's easy to say, but it's hard to live through that. But many have. Job did. Job served the Lord even in this time of great suffering. The same faith that enabled some people to escape suffering, the same faith enabled others to endure suffering. And these are mysteries that we don't have the answer to. God is able to deliver us that's what the Hebrew children that were about to be thrown in the fiery furnace, remember what they said to the king? We know our God is able to deliver us from this fire. But if not, but if he doesn't, we want you to know we are not going to bow down and worship your golden image. If God wants to, he can deliver us. But he may not choose to deliver us. We don't know. And you know we don't know. We don't know. We really don't know what God has in store for us in this world. You know, I have a, my mother is still living. And she's 92 years old. But for the last five years, uh, she suffered from uh, Dementia, pretty bad. And those of you who have loved ones or have had loved ones who have dealt with that, you understand uh, what that involves. And it's one, I think, one of the most difficult things that anyone has to deal with, the individual themselves and those who love them and try to care for them. Uh, but I'm not saying that in, in a way of complaining, but I'm just saying it in a way that none of us know, none of us know what we may face before we leave this world. We don't know. But may God help us to have the grace and the faith to serve God anyhow. To serve God anyhow. The second question, not only... Will a person serve the Lord if you have to suffer? But will you serve the Lord if your friends forsake you? Now, we're told that Job had three friends. At least that's one opinion of them. I mean... <laughs> Somebody said, if you're only friends you got are like Job's, you know, you're in trouble. Job had three friends, so-called, that came to see him. And they all said to Job, basically, Job, there ain't no way you're right with God, man. There ain't nobody go through what you go through and be right with the Lord. And so they accused Job of being a hypocrite. They said, Job, you've got to have something wrong in your life. Things this terrible don't just happen to people that love God. I mean, you've done something wrong, Job. The Lord's judging you. No, they were judging Job, and they were misjudging Job. They thought they knew what was wrong with Job, but they didn't know. They didn't know. You know, we have to be careful about that, don't we? Sometimes we think we know what's wrong with somebody, but we may not really know. The Lord may just be putting somebody through a terrible trial of their faith, and we may not understand that. And they didn't know, uh, but they accused Job. And, uh, you know, we need friends. We need friends. We need real friends, don't we? 
We don't need the kind of friends like Job had, but we need friends. Sad to say, but Job's friends turned their back on him when he had a great need. But here's the thing. Job still served the Lord. He still served the Lord. And then another question. Will you serve the Lord when God is silent? When things like this happen, usually one of the first things we start doing is asking questions. The big question is, why? Lord, why? Why did you let this happen? Why did that happen? Lord, why is this taking place? Why me, Lord? Why me? And we ask that question, why? And what makes it so hard is a lot of times there's no answer from the Lord. You get in Job chapter 23 and you find Job saying, I looked on the right hand. I couldn't find the Lord. He said, I looked on the left. I couldn't find him. He said, I looked up. I, I looked ahead of me. I couldn't find him. I looked behind me. He said, every direction I look, he said, quite honestly, he said, I couldn't see where God was in any of it. He said, I couldn't find God in none of it. And the Lord was not saying anything to Job at that time. If you start over here where Job's tragedy begins, and you go through the book of Job and you find where Job's talking, you find where his friends are talking, you find where this other guy comes along, I believe his name was Elihu, and Elihu comes along and he starts talking. Do you know how far you go in the 42 chapters of Job before God says one word to Job? You get all the way to chapter 38. All the way to chapter 38 before God has anything to say to Job. And when the Lord does start talking to Job, wow, God began to speak to Job. He spoke out of a whirlwind. And, Job, and God says to Job something like this, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? He said, Job, where were you then? Uh, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, where were you when I made the cloud and the garment and the thick darkness? And he, and he goes on and on and on. And God speaks about his might and his power and his greatness. In essence, the Lord's saying to Job, Job, don't question me now. I know what I'm doing, Job. Job, I'm the God that made this world. I'm the God that laid the foundation of the earth. Job, I'm the God that made everything you see. Job, don't you think I have enough wisdom to know what I'm doing? Again, that's easy to preach, but that's hard to accept. But the truth is, the truth is this. God loves you too much to do you wrong, and he is too wise to make a mistake. That's easy for me to say, but nevertheless, it is true. He loves you too much to do you wrong. And he is too wise to make a mistake. Can we serve God when we don't know the reason why? Can we serve God when he's not explained it to us? He's silent. Job did. But Job's suffering was not the end of the story because when you get to chapter 42... God said to Job, he said, Job, there's something I need you to do for me. And Job said, what, are you, what is it you want me to do, Lord? And the Lord said, them friends of yours, they need a lot of prayer. He said, Job, I want you to pray for your friends. Will you do that for me? I want you to pray for your friends, Job. And Job got down and he prayed for his friends, the ones that falsely accused him, 
the ones that called him a hypocrite, Job prayed for them. And as soon as Job got done praying, the Lord turned the captivity of Job and he gave him back twice what he took away. In the end, he blessed him. Now here's the thing, as a Christian, you may suffer down here sometime. God may in this world turn your captivity. He might, he might. But if he doesn't do it here, if you're saved, when you get home to glory, all your troubles and all your sorrows and all your hurts and all your pains will be gone. And he'll wipe all tears from your eyes. And you'll have a body like his. And you'll live an eternal day with him. God will turn your captivity either here or there. Your suffering will come to an end. Blessed be his name. Can we serve the Lord? Can we serve the Lord when the devil says there's no reason to serve him? Job served him anyhow. May the Lord help us to be able to do that. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness, your blessings, your mercies that you've extended to us. Help us, Lord, to love you and help us to serve you. Regardless of what may come, Lord, that's easy for us to say. It's easy to say. But Lord, when those times of difficulty come, give us the grace, give us faith. Help us to love you just because you are God. Help us to love you simply because you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.